In this module, we will be discussing pneumothorax. The learning objectives for this module are the following. Review the normal physiology of the pleural space, discuss the pathophysiology of pneumothorax, describe the clinical presentation of pneumothorax, identify pneumothorax on a chest radiograph, and cite treatment options for pneumothorax. To begin, Let's review the normal anatomy and physiology of the pleural space. Recall that the pleural space is bordered by the visceral pleura, which lines the outer surface of the lungs, and also by the parietal pleura, which lines the deep surface of the chest wall. The two layers of tissue are continuous at the hilum of each lung and form a potential space between them. Note that the lungs have a natural tendency to collapse inward and bring the visceral pleura with them. Conversely, the chest wall has a natural tendency to recoil outward, which would drag the parietal pleura with it. Thus, we see that the two layers of pleura are being pulled in opposite directions. These forces work to slightly expand the pleural space, causing a drop in pressure within the space. This is similar to the partial vacuum created by pulling backwards on the plunger of a syringe. This sub-atmospheric pressure within the pleural space is responsible for keeping the lungs expanded and preventing their collapse. Pneumothorax can result any time there is an abnormal connection between the pleural space and the atmosphere. Typically, this occurs when the lung parenchyma is ruptured for some reason, forming a connection between the pleural space and the atmosphere by way of the patient's airways. Less commonly, a penetrating wound to the chest could form a connection between the pleural space and the atmosphere that tunnels through the chest wall. As we've discussed, the pleural space is held at a pressure below that of the atmosphere. Thus, if a connection develops between the pleural space and the atmosphere, atmospheric air will rush into the space and equalize the pressure. Once the pleural space is no longer at a sub-atmospheric pressure, the force holding the lung open is lost and the lung will collapse inward while the chest recoils outward. There are a number of potential causes of pneumothorax. To categorize them, we'll use the scheme shown here. We'll start by discussing traumatic pneumothorax, since it is easiest to grasp. As implied by the name, this is a pneumothorax that occurs secondary to a traumatic cause. Pneumothorax can result from a penetrating injury to the chest wall, such as a gunshot wound, a stab injury, or injuries sustained from a motor vehicle accident. Pneumothorax can also result from the pressure changes associated with scuba diving or air travel. There are also iatrogenic causes of traumatic pneumothorax. For instance, there is a notable risk of pneumothorax associated with placement of central venous catheters in the internal jugular and subclavian veins. Pneumothorax may also occur during mechanical ventilation, which is associated with elevated airway pressures. Iatrogenic pneumothorax may also result from thoracentesis, lung biopsy, and a variety of other procedures involving the thoracic region. Conversely, spontaneous pneumothorax occurs in the absence of any traumatic injury. Spontaneous pneumothorax can be further divided into two categories. Primary spontaneous pneumothorax occurs in the absence of any predisposing lung disease. This involves the rupture of a small bleb on the surface of the lung. It most often occurs near the lung apex, and this is thought to be related to high mechanical stress that can occur in this region. Primary spontaneous pneumothorax most commonly occurs in tall, young, male patients. Alternatively, secondary spontaneous pneumothorax refers to pneumothorax in the setting of underlying lung disease. This underlying lung disease may include COPD, cystic fibrosis, or pneumocystis pneumonia. We will also discuss a subtype of pneumothorax known as tension pneumothorax. This can occur when the communication between the pleural space and the atmosphere functions as a one-way valve. This is most often a flap of tissue that overhangs the communication. When air is drawn into the thorax during inspiration, the flap of tissue is forced aside and air moves into the pleural space. However, when the air is forced out of the thorax during expiration, the flap of tissue covers the opening and prevents air from exiting the pleural space. 
with each breath the patient takes more air is drawn into the pleural space and the pressure builds given enough time pressure can build to the point where it begins to compress mediastinal structures this will impair venous return to the heart and can result in hemodynamic collapse analogous to cardiac tamponade note that while tension can develop in a pneumothorax of any etiology it more commonly occurs in the setting of traumatic pneumothorax pneumothorax generally presents with sudden onset of unilateral pleuritic chest pain and dyspnea if the pneumothorax is small the loss of lung volume on one side can cause mediastinal structures to shift towards the collapsed lung. If present, this finding is generally subtle. Physical examination of a patient with pneumothorax may also reveal decreased breath sounds and hyperresonance to percussion on the affected side. The presentation of tension pneumothorax is much more dramatic. The patient will present with increasing respiratory distress. The accumulation of pressure on one side of the thorax will cause mediastinal structures to shift away from the collapsed lung, evidenced by tracheal deviation and displacement of the apex beat. Impending hemodynamic collapse will be indicated by tachycardia and distension of neck veins. Here, we must discuss an important detail in the workup of pneumothorax. Tension pneumothorax is a life-threatening condition that requires immediate intervention. If suspected, the diagnosis should be made on clinical grounds and the patient treated emergently. Conversely, if tension is not evident based on the patient's history and physical examination, then chest x-ray is the appropriate diagnostic study. Chest x-ray in a patient with pneumothorax will reveal partial or complete collapse of the lung. While complete collapse of the lung can be fairly obvious, pneumothorax of any size is most readily identified by a lack of lung markings, which should extend to the edge of the thoracic cavity. In the setting of tension pneumothorax, the chest x-ray will show evidence of increased pressure within the pleural space. While mediastinal deviation is the most obvious finding in these cases, more subtle Findings may include flattening of the hemidiaphragm and increased rib spacing on the affected side. Here is the chest x-ray of a second patient with tension pneumothorax. Note how dramatic the mediastinal shift is in this film. While chest x-ray is a widely used and easy to learn technique for diagnosing pneumothorax, other techniques can be employed. Ultrasound, in the hands of a trained expert, has the benefit of being performed at the bedside and has a higher sensitivity. CT scan, while not routinely used for evaluation of simple pneumothorax, is considered the gold standard for diagnosis. It can be used to identify small pneumothoraces as well as potentially elucidate the underlying cause of the pneumothorax. Now that we can identify the various types of pneumothorax, let's describe the various treatments we can employ as well as discuss when they are indicated. Supplemental oxygen therapy relies on the principle of diffusion to draw air out of the pleural space. We first have to remember that the composition of air is 21% oxygen and 79% nitrogen. This is the composition of air existing in both the lung and the pleural space we can use the process of diffusion to help decompress our patient. By giving 100% O2, we change the concentration gradient of nitrogen. 100% O2 dilutes nitrogen out of the lung and the nitrogen from the pneumothorax will diffuse from the pleural space into the lungs. The nitrogen will subsequently be exhaled to the environment. This removal of nitrogen will shrink the volume of air inside the pleural space and allow the lung to re-expand. In needle decompression, we insert a needle and French catheter large enough to traverse the chest wall at the second intercostal space at the midclavicular line. The needle is inserted slowly until a pop is felt followed by a decrease in resistance, representing the piercing of the pleura and entrance into the pleural space. Once the catheter is in place and needle is removed, air is manually aspirated using a syringe attached to a stopcock. 
Aspiration should continue until resistance is met or four liters of air has been removed. Alternatively, the same procedure can be performed at the anterior axillary line at the fourth or fifth intercostal space. This location may be beneficial for patients with a larger body habitus and also is the location of subsequent tube thoracostomy. Needle decompression is a quick response to patients with pneumothorax in unstable condition. However, subsequent definitive decompression must still be achieved. With chest tube thoracostomy, the chest tube will be placed at the fifth intercostal space along the mid-axillary line. A pathway for the chest tube should be blunt dissected with a hemostat, and then chest tube can be subsequently fed into the pleural space. There are three important notes about this procedure. First, the incision into the skin should be made slightly inferior to the point of entry. This allows a flap of skin to hold the tube in place and serve as a physical barrier to entry by infectious microbes. Second, the chest tube should run over the top of the rib as to avoid the neurovascular bundle on the inferior side. Third, once in the pleural space, the chest tube should be directed superiorly and posteriorly. After proper insertion, this chest tube can then be attached to a one-way Heimlich valve or chest tube drainage system capable of measuring air or fluid removed from the cavity. If the lung does not automatically reinflate, suction may be applied to facilitate decompression. A variety of chest tube sizes are available for use in the execution of tube thoracostomy, typically ranging from 12 French to 42 French. In general, it is best to match the size of the tube to the size of the pneumothorax. For instance, to correct a small pneumothorax in a clinically stable patient, a tube size of 16 French to 22 French would be appropriate. Larger pneumothoraces would merit larger tube sizes. Additionally, if hemothorax or empyema is suspected, a tube size of 36 French or larger should be used. Now that we have an understanding of the various treatment options for pneumothorax, let's discuss when each is used. Treatment of pneumothorax varies based on factors such as type, size, and how stable the patient is. Let's first discuss what it means for our patient to be considered stable. Stability is defined by the following. Respiratory rate less than 24 breaths per minute. Heart rate between 60 and 120 beats per minute. Normal blood pressure. Ox sat over 90% on room air and speaking in complete sentences. We will use this definition of stability when talking about potential treatment options. Let's begin our discussion with primary spontaneous pneumothorax. If the patient is unstable, we move to immediate decompression using needle aspiration or chest tube thoracostomy. If the patient is stable, a chest x-ray should be ordered to assess the size of the pneumothorax. A pneumothorax smaller than 3 cm can be treated with supplemental oxygen and observation. A pneumothorax larger than 3 cm should be treated with chest tube thoracostomy. It is important to remember that pneumothorax size quantification uses measurements in centimeters from a 2D chest x-ray to make inferences about lung volumes in three dimensions. Although these two-dimensional measurements are the most reliable method for determining size, it is still important to use clinical judgment when choosing treatments. Secondary spontaneous pneumothoraces have largely the same approach, with a few exceptions. In the case of secondary spontaneous pneumothorax, chest tube thoracostomy has been proven to have better outcomes than needle decompression, despite being more invasive and increasing patient discomfort. Secondary spontaneous pneumothoraces are also less likely to be remedied using oxygen and observation alone. Given that the lung is already diseased, clinicians must treat other pulmonary symptoms using bronchodilators and other appropriate therapies as well as be prepared to quickly decompress the patient should they become unstable.
Traumatic pneumothoraces are a clinical diagnosis based on the presentation of an unstable patient as a result of traumatic events, such as motor vehicle accidents, gunshot wounds, or stabbings. These pneumothoraces are always treated immediately with chest tube thoracostomy or needle decompression. You should be aware that variations on the treatment modalities discussed here do exist, but are outside the scope of this module. These include, but are not limited to, the use of pigtail catheters for small pneumothoraces, finger thoracostomy for emergent cases, and the use of thoracic vents as a means to preserve the patient's ambulatory capacity. Thank you for watching our module. For further information on pneumothorax and its treatment, please refer to Clinical Procedures in Emergency Medicine by Roberts and Hedges.